and I will show wonders in the heavens and in the earth, blood and fire and pillars of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness, and the moon into blood before the great and the terrible day of the Lord come. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be delivered. For in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem shall be deliverance, as the Lord hath said, and in the remnant whom the Lord shall call. Amen, and welcome everybody to the Remnant Call. I am your host, Brother Frank, and excited to have you here tonight with us. We have another guest back. You heard him last week, Brother Benjamin Baruch, and this is going to be part two. We were only planning on originally a a single-part episode, but it was so good. Uh, on the title was called The Promise, and this will be The Promise Part 2. It was so good that we just had to have Benjamin back and, and just to continue down this path. And just wanted to say a few things. Thank you so much to everyone out there who's been supporting The Remnant Call, liking us on Facebook, uh, checking us out on YouTube, and just helping us to share this last day's end-time message. Folks, Jesus is coming again. And we got to be about the Father's business. These are serious times that we live in. And we've got to be about this great end-time work of sharing the good news because there is a harvest out there. And the fields are ripe, but the problem is people are just sitting numb in their pews. And God needs a people that are ready to work and to get out there and to warn the people and to share this good news. Folks, no one likes to be left in the dark. No one likes to be at work and everybody else knows what's going on except them. Folks, it's like that for the lost. They want to know the truth too, but someone's got to tell them, and God's calling us as his people to be his instruments, his mouthpiece in these last days to warn the people that Jesus is coming back soon, and we need to repent, get right, and get ready, and get about our Father's business. So with that, I just want to say special thanks to everybody. Thank you for uh, good friends who've been supporting the broadcast behind the scenes. We just appreciate that uh, for everything, and just say thank you, and God bless for all that and with that we're not going to delay we're going to get brother benjamin right on the line here and if folks if you did not hear part one of the promise go back out check it out in the archives you want to check it out because benjamin kind of sets the stage for where part two is but if you this is the first time you're listening in tonight check it out you can go back and hear part one later and with that we're going to bring on benjamin to the program brother benjamin are you there with us hey frank yeah i'm here well, praise God. Benjamin, I just want to say thanks for coming back on. Um, man, I, I tell you, last week it just it got so good and, and so exciting, and, and I've been looking forward to this program all week. And, Benjamin, I, every time you come on, God just blesses. And I know that's not you, it's Him, and for that we give Him the glory for that. And I uh, just want to say welcome um, and uh, thank you for being back here and, and looking forward to where you're going to lead us tonight. Well, thank you, Frank. It's, uh, you know, it's always a blessing to be able to share, to, to preach from the Word of God. And, and you know, we can, we can do a little with um, the, maybe the couple of fish or the couple of the loaves that we have, you know, the little, the little bit of living manna that we've received and the, and the life of Jesus that's in each one of us. But when the hand of the Lord is added, and when the Lord puts his finger to the work that is being done, suddenly, instead of a few loaves and a few fish, we, we have manna from heaven. We have enough to feed thousands, tens of thousands. You know, the, the word becomes alive, and it's done by the Spirit of God. And, and um, you know, there's, there's really no comparison with the work that is blessed by the Lord um, and the work that we might attempt, you know, in our own, in our own strength. We could build the wood, hay, and stubble, but, um, you know, it's of limited value. And so I thank the Lord that he honors the reading of his word, and, and um, he honors, you know, God moves to touch the listeners. The fact that the Lord blessed the program last week, and, and I pray God would bless the reading of his word tonight as well. 
he does that not because of me or because of any of the people that might be bringing the message. It has nothing to do with the messenger. They're just instruments. It has to do with the audience, the people that God wants to reach. Amen. So, you know, I'm, I know it's the heart of the Lord to, to reach and to touch his people in this hour. And Frank, we are very quickly entering into the, what will prove to be the final hours before all these things that we've been warning of and you know, our listeners have been keenly aware of you know, the events of the judgment of God. Uh, they are indeed coming upon us. And yet the Lord, who is so grace, gracious and so full of mercy, continues to plead with the people that we might enter into the promise of his protection, the promise of the, the blessing of being an overcomer. You know, there's a tsunami. There's a tidal wave of darkness that's even now coming upon the earth, Frank, and and this darkness, I mean, it is a tsunami, like the tsunami that hit the coast of Japan and devastated that Fukushima plant. And You know, if you put your foot in that water, you were swept away. And this tsunami of darkness is going to be so powerful that we just have to come out from among them. We can't play, we can't play the, the role of the fence sitter anymore. You know, we've got to come out and be separate and touch not the unclean thing because this force of evil that's going to be released into this final chapter of human history as the abyss opens and is you know Satan has been bound I know that sounds maybe preposterous but but it's true I mean in the life of the church and in the life of of our country, in the lives that we've all lived, you know, the evil has been very much contained. And, you know, it's had its place and it's had its day, but it hasn't had the day. You know, we've been able to live in peace and we've, we've you know, we've worked and we've raised children and you know, we've done our jobs, and we've some of us have ministered, and we've, we've gone to church, and, and we do so in the safety and in the peace that has been our life. And that is all about to end. But for the remnant, the promise of peace and the promise of safety continues. Not so with everybody else. And that's going to be the difference, because the world is about to become unhinged. That's a different message for another night. Uh, we will be actually, and when I say we, I'm referring to myself, Jeff Nyquist, and Doug Woodward, are going to be bringing a urgent re- update, kind of a current events update on, you know, wh- what's really happening in Russia. Everybody's a Russian agent now, and you know, where it's the real state of affairs with uh, Russia versus the United States, and it's not a pretty picture, people. And as uh, Jeff Nyquist said to me, we, we went over all the latest information that, that has become available. And last night he said to me, we are running out of time. And those of you that know Jeff, um, that's a, he has not said words like that in the 20 years that I've known him. You know, Jeff always told me, no, no, it's years away, it's years away, it's years away. And, well, it's not years away any longer. But anyway... Enough for that commercial and the advertisement for next for the next um, program that's going to be brought forth. And you know, Frank, we could probably do something similar here on on Remnant Call if you wish um, in, the, in the next coming weeks. But let's get into part two of the promise. And before we begin, and before I fumble around and waste any more of all of our time, let's commit this time to the Lord in prayer. Amen. Pray with me, would you, Father? We look to you. Father, this is your day that has come. It is the day of the Lord, and it's the day in which Jesus Christ is going to be lifted up, and you're going to demonstrate to the world who you are as God Almighty. And to the wicked, you're going to reveal yourself as the judge of eternal righteousness. 
and to your people who have come to you in humble and repentant hearts, you are going to reveal yourself as the God who is a mighty deliverer of his people. And Lord, vengeance is yours. You are going to repay the debt that it is owed. And you told us to forgive, and to not seek our own vengeance. You said, vengeance is mine, and mine alone, and the day of vengeance draws near. And Lord, I pray that you would touch us powerfully, that we would be clean of all bitterness and all unforgiveness. None of these deceptions of the enemy would give Satan any advantage against your people. So, Lord, that we could inherit and enter into the promises of your word, the promise of deliverance, the promise of the blessing to the overcomer in this hour, and that the enemy would have nothing in us and nothing against us. So, Lord, bless the reading and the study of your word tonight. Pray that you would minister by the power of your Holy Spirit. And we stand in agreement, Lord, asking that your will be done. Let your perfect will be done in each of our lives. Father, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Praise God. Thank you, Lord. The promises of God, the word in the Greek means a divine assurance of good, a divine assurance, God's assurance of blessing and of hope and a reason for faith. And we have the promise and the assurance of good in the words of Holy Scripture. For the Word of God is the life of Jesus Christ. And so, praise God. Let's pick up where we left off at part one with the Lord again repeating a second time the admonition that he gave to the apostles. And this text is coming from the book of Acts, chapter 1, verse 4, and the scripture reads, And being assembled together with them, he commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but should wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, You've heard of me. The Lord was repeating this admonition, this commandment to the disciples, that they wait for that which was promised. For he, and he continues saying, For John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. And in other texts, the baptism of the Holy Ghost is described as a baptism of fire. And truly our God is a consuming fire. And the true presence of the Holy Ghost is a manifest presence of fire. If you could see the presence of the Holy Spirit with your eyes, you would see the Shekinah, the Shekinah, glory of God, which is a dark, deep, golden, burning light. Light emanating out of the presence of God. This light is the light of the world. And we are to wait. We, you know, the Word of God is fulfilled more than one time. This commandment to the disciples in Jerusalem is also a commandment to each one of us that we need to learn to wait on the Lord, wait for the power and the leading of the Holy Spirit. I know that when I first was shown the day of the Lord by literally being translated out of my living room, and translated into the future, and I was there to personally experience the Great Tribulation. And it was a devastating, it was a, I don't even know the right words, I mean, it was, you know, it was traumatic to experience the Great Tribulation. I mean, this is, you know, more intense than anything any of us have ever been through, and I had personally seen some pretty intense trauma already, in some of the circumstances that can happen in this world, but, but the tribulation time that's coming is so above, you know, such has never been, is what's about to begin, and yet we can be kept in peace. 
But when the Lord brought me back, and after I stopped trembling for seven days, Frank, I literally, I was shaking for seven days. I couldn't stop shaking. I was so afraid. I mean, fear had just, fear came upon me from what I had seen, what I had experienced. And, and men's hearts will be failing them from fear. The events that are going to be taking place on the earth. This is a fearful time unless we are walking in full of the power of the Holy Spirit. But when I was brought back to the what was the year 1996, after I had sort of regained some of my composure, I felt a burning desire to try to warn everybody. I mean, I just started, I had to try to tell my family and my friends what I had seen. And yet, now 20 years later, on the, as we are approaching the actual fulfillment of these things, which in my opinion are going to come upon the earth in the next one to two years, at least in terms of the beginning of the judgment in, that's coming upon the United States of America, I had this burning desire to tell anybody and everybody, and I wasn't waiting on the Lord. I was just going. And, you know, the Lord had to kind of rein me in and, and teach me that, you know, there are, you can be well-intentioned, but we really need to pray, we really need to learn the, the discipline of waiting on the Lord. Don't just presume you should tell everybody. The scripture also says, The prudent shall keep silent, for the days are evil. You know, in many ways, it is much better to be prudent and silent than to be shouting from the housetops the message of the judgment of Almighty God, particularly in a world that is about to become demon-possessed. The prudent shall be silent. They will hide themselves. So we only want to speak, we only want to act, we only want to do the things that are being led by the Holy Spirit. We don't want to go off half-cocked in our knowledge of good and evil. In what seems right, our impulsive, emotional you know, reaction seems like the right thing to do, but it's not. The Lord told the disciples, wait for the promise of the Father, which is the baptism of the Holy Spirit. We, too, need to learn to wait for the leading of the Holy Spirit. And when we pray, we need to pray and wait, and we need to travail in prayer and wait for the breakthrough of the Holy Spirit. And even when we pray about different matters, we need to learn to wait for the confirmation that the prayer has been, that it's done. And I know in the charismatic church, and, you know, thank God for those of you that were not part of the charismatic church, you should bless the Lord that you avoided so much error, because the charismatic church that experienced a mighty outpouring of the Holy Spirit in the 1970s fell under just incredible error in the 1980s. And it only got worse from there, to the point that now there's this false anointing. You know, it's actually a kundalini devil. And, I mean, it, it's manifesting in countless congregations. And the people have so fallen from the love of the truth, they cannot discern the difference. But in these charismatic churches, so many errors were also introduced alongside of all of these deceptions. And, you know, one of these errors was this word of faith movement. And you guys understand, Satan is really smart. When he's going to bring an error, he's going to twist the scriptures. It's not going to be blatantly wrong. He's not going to come in and tell us some lie that is absurd. It's going to be just a slight degree of wrong. The Word of Faith movement was just slightly wrong. And so people would be naming it and claiming it for all the desires of the flesh, which is ridiculous. God didn't give us the power of the kingdom to fulfill the lust of the flesh. Mm. But in addition, people would pray about legitimate things. They would pray, you know, to... Um, overturn the, the principalities and the powers, and maybe to, to take back ground that had been previously, you know, overrun by the forces of darkness, or, or they'd be praying about any number of things in the Spirit. And 
They would just say, you know, a one-minute prayer and go, well, it's done. You know, I'm claiming it, but it's not done. You've got to wait for the breakthrough. And uh, I'm not sure why I'm, someone is needing to hear this. We can't just presume. You know, you wait, you tarry until the breakthrough of the Lord. And, you know, I'm reminded of a time I, I went to um, kind of a camp meeting, you know, a revival meeting, and it, it was very much anointed, and, and the man that was leading it was very full of the Holy Spirit, and, and he asked people to come forward. You know, anybody that wants prayer, come forward for prayer. And about 100 people went forward, and I went forward, and, and everybody stood in a long row, and he prayed. He just went down the row one by one, praying for every person and, until he got to me, and he skips me, and he prays for every other person. <laughs> and everyone, after they received prayer, they sat down, and I'm standing up there by myself by the end of the <laughs> service, kind of feeling a little awkward, you know, wondering now, what's up with that? Well, I came back the next night, and... Um, Again, he said, Do, would anyone want prayer? Come forward. And, you know, not to be deterred. Benjamin goes forward again. And again, everybody lines up, and he's praying one by one for each person. He comes to me, and this time, instead of skipping me, he says to me, what are you doing coming forward? And I'm like, what? Oh, you, you know, I said, you've asked if people wanted prayer. Um, so I came, <laughs> He's like, no, you shouldn't be coming forward for prayer. You're supposed to be up here praying for the people. And he said, come here. And then he started praying for someone, and he looks at me. He's laying hands on this person. He's praying for someone who needed some kind of breakthrough. And he looks at me, and he says, can you feel the Spirit of God is being quenched? And I'm like, yes, I feel it. He's like, we keep praying until the breakthrough. And then all of a sudden, you could just feel the anointing break loose. And he looks at me, he says, can you feel the breakthrough? I said, yes, I do. And he said, that's when we know we're done. And so, you know, we have to wait for the breakthrough. We've got to wait for the reality. Yeah, the kingdom is received and believed through faith, but it's not denial theology. You know, we don't walk around, you know, sick with the flu, and, you know, you're, you're at 103 fever, and, you know, you're claiming your healing, and you're still at 103 fever. This is, these are denials of reality. No, no, we wait for the real, because the real is common, people. And it is not a contradiction. There's a reality to the things of the kingdom, and there's a reality to the promise of our God. And we need to wait for the reality of what God is about to do. Acts chapter 2, verse 38 and 39. Peter said unto them, Repent! That's probably the one thing missing from the church today. They got all the other doctrines, most of which were fashioned by the imagination of men. Very few people have the true repentance and the humility and the meekness of the Spirit of God. But we need to repent and be baptized, everyone, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of our sins. And you too shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost, for the promise is unto you, and to your children, and to all that are far off, even as many as the, lo the Lord our God shall call. And so the promise is even unto the last generation, which is our generation. And with many other words did Peter testify and exhort them, saying, Save yourselves from this untoward generation. And that word in the Greek is skolios, and it means warped. It means perverse, crooked, just unclean, wicked people. And that's this generation. The Bible calls the last generation the generation of his wrath. And it's a perverted generation. It is a perverse and crooked and wicked generation. We need to save ourselves. Save yourself from this wicked generation in the sense of come out from among them. We can't run with them anymore. We can't sit and, and soak in the entertainment that they worship. We can't do the things they do. We can't live the way they live, and we cannot speak the way that they speak. We need to repent 
come out from among them, become a separate people, and touch not the unclean thing. And then you can receive the promise of the Holy Spirit. Romans 4, verse 13. For the promise that Abraham, the promise was given to Abraham that he should become the heir of the world. Abraham and his children are going to inherit the world. This is ours, brothers and sisters. It belongs to our God. He is going to give it to us after he redeems it, takes it back and establishes his eternal kingdom. The Lord is going to give the world to Abraham and to his seed. But the promise that Abraham should be heir of the world was not to Abraham or to his seed through the law. Wow. Romans 4.13 Abraham received the promise which was the word of God's redemption, the restoration of relationship, the blessing of the seed. The Messiah was going to come through his bloodline and the restoration, the salvation to the whole earth would come through Abraham and through his children, but not through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. Now this issue has got a lot of people confused. A lot of people are thinking that the promise of the Holy Spirit and the promise of the overcoming power to live a victorious life comes to the children of God through the law, but it does not. The promise was received through the righteousness of faith. For if they which are of the law be heirs, then faith is made void, and the promise made is of no effect. Whoa! Look at Romans 4.13, you guys. If it was earned by keeping the law, then your faith has become void. Mm -hmm. And if there's one subject that has so many confused in this hour, it's the relationship between faith and law. Walking in the Spirit and following, attempting to follow, rather, the commandments of God through the knowledge of good and evil, which is the mind of the flesh, through the strength of the flesh, the truth of the matter is, the law was given as a tutor to show us the mind and the will of God. Do not murder your neighbor. To the man in the flesh, that was a revelation. To the person walking in the Holy Spirit, that is the, that's already in their heart through the love of God. They don't need a law telling them, don't murder your neighbor. The love of God already leads them into righteousness. And so the things of the law, which are a tutor, are there to instruct us in what is righteous, but we cannot enter or receive the promise through the tutor. The tutor was merely there to teach us while we were yet in the mind of the flesh. We needed instruction in the ways of the flesh, but the promise is in inherited through the Spirit. The Bible tells us that the flesh profits nothing. You can do your best effort in the flesh to honor God and to keep His commandments and to do everything that in your knowledge of good and evil you think you should be doing, and you will maybe win Pharisee of the Year. You might win the Pharisee of the Year award, but you will not impress the Lord because the flesh can profit you nothing. Only the Spirit gives life. And, you know, this issue of how to really enter in, you know, a lot of people today are thinking, well, we need to go back and, you know, figure out how to keep the Old Covenant, you know, one more time. Let's go back to the Old Covenant. The Old Covenant has, you know, the Torah and all the commandments, you know, and if we could just do those perfectly, then we would have the promise of the presence of the Holy Spirit. We'd have the promise of the power of God, and we could overcome the world, the devil, and our own flesh. And the answer is no, you cannot. Not through the flesh. Because the flesh profits nothing. And yet, 
you know, our natural mind, in the, in the knowledge of our natural mind, which is corrupted by the knowledge of good and evil, it's so easily, easily for us to be confused and caught up thinking that we're going to receive the promise through the efforts of our flesh. And that is nothing more than the dark counsel of this fallen world. And if you guys have not heard the dark counsel message, I would encourage you to go listen to it because we take that into great, great detail. Mm, Romans 4.16, Therefore it is of faith that it might be by grace to the end, the promise might be sure to all of the seed, not to that only which is of the law, but to that also which is of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. And Abraham, this is verse 20, Romans 4, Abraham staggered not at the promises of God through unbelief. Abraham did not doubt what God said, the victory, the blessing the inheritance. God promised it. Abraham believed and was strong in faith, giving glory to God and being fully persuaded that what he had promised, what God had promised, God was able to perform. Therefore, it was imputed to him for righteousness. The fact that he believed God's word. And having received righteousness by faith, Abraham also walked with the Lord, and so he walked in righteousness. Frank, are we are we good? I'm getting a little feedback. Uh, I'm not hearing it here, but yeah, everything sounds good on my side right now. But, uh... Okay, awesome. Galatians 3.14, that the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles. The blessing of Abraham came upon the Gentiles through Jesus Christ, that we too might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. You know, the question is, how do we enter in? The darkness that is about to be released on this earth is without precedent. You know, I saw a a little glimpse into the darkness a little over a year ago, there was a time, for a couple of days, there was spiritual warfare uh, at such a level that the, I, I don't know how to describe it, I guess I would say there was a tear in the, in the wall that had separated the spirit world from the created world, and the demonic was pouring through like the, the hole in the side of the Titanic, and for two days, wherever I went, the people, I would just be walking down the street, and as I would walk by people, they would go crazy. They would start yelling, and literally going into like epileptic seizures. And not just one of them, all of them. It was absolutely unbelievable. I'd never seen anything like it in my life. You know, the whole world lies in the evil one. We know that from Scripture. I was seeing living proof of how enemy could animate all of these people because the veil had been torn between the two realms well that's what's coming in the great tribulation the abyss will open the veil will be torn and the power of darkness is going to fill the earth that which has been appointed to destruction is going to be converted wholly unto evil But in the camp of the righteous, the promise of the Holy Spirit will be fulfilled, and that without measure. There's going to be no way to walk through the Great Tribulation through the knowledge of good and evil. There'll be no way to... I don't think you'll survive for five minutes in the strength of the flesh. It's ridiculous. It would be like standing on the beach of, of Japan... You know, and trying to hold back the tsunami with the strength of your arms. You would just be picked up and thrown inland 30 miles. And you'd be probably dead by the time you got there. No, we have to inherit the true promise 
of the presence of the Holy Spirit, we've got to find the way into the secret hiding place of the Lord. And, you know, our natural mind instantly thinks, oh, I've got to do something in the power of my flesh. And, yes, we need to repent, but we need to look to the Lord and we need to learn to rest. The Sabbath is an illustration. It's a tutor. The Sabbath day is a tutor to teach us how to enter into the things of the Spirit. Because we're not like the little choo-choo train. I know I can, I know I can. We don't work ourselves up in an emotional state of mind to enter into the Spirit. We enter into a Sabbath rest and in a place of our hearts being consecrated totally unto the Lord that allows us to enter into the Spirit world in the very presence of the Holy Spirit. And believe me, there are a lot of very religious people who huff and puff in the power of the flesh, and they do a lot of things in the strength of the flesh, and they, are, they have not the Spirit of Jesus Christ. And their folly will be self-evident as the tidal waves of darkness of the Great Tribulation begin to roll across this planet. Only the Lord can baptize us in the Holy Spirit. Mm. And we receive the blessing of the promise of God by humbling ourselves, turning from all of our wicked ways, learning to fast and pray. And fasting is really key to unhinging the, the bondage of the flesh and to allow the flesh to basically die to lose its strength, to lose its hold on us so that we begin to enter into the things of the Spirit. The promise is of the Spirit through faith. Galatians 3.14, the blessing of Abraham has come upon the Gentiles through Jesus Christ, not through the law. The blessing of Abraham, first of all, Abraham didn't even have the law, my friends. He had God's promise of a seed, and the promise of a Savior. But there was no Torah. That was given later through Moses to teach a bunch of obstinate, stiff-necked people who were walking in the darkness, the dark counsel of the mind of the flesh, to give them a tutor on what it meant to do things God's way. But in the New Covenant, we're not supposed to rely on the tutor. We're supposed to be born again and filled with the very Spirit of God that leads us in the ways of God and leads us into the presence of God when we pray. And we're not going to get there through the mind of the flesh. We're going to receive these things through the promise of the Spirit and through faith. And I'm not saying that we disregard the commandments or the will of the Lord. No, we fulfill them, but we do so through the Spirit and not through the mind of the flesh. Galatians. You know, Benjamin, um, I wanted yeah, to say, you reminded me, um, you know, when they ate of that tree of the knowledge of good and evil, the day you eat of that, the Lord said, you will surely die. And it seems like today that it's the knowledge of good and evil is what's driving the church member in all of their decisions. And you see that when you go into church and someone, they look at other people and they say, well, we know, well, they're, I'm right and they're wrong. Therefore, I'm better and they're lost. And, and the problem is this knowledge of good and evil only brings death. And, and I find that we need to switch back over to the tree of life, which Jesus, we know, is represents the tree of life, and whoever eats his flesh and drinks his blood, you know, and, and will will have life everlasting. And and it's that tree of the knowledge of good and evil. It's killing the church today. Oh, amen, brother. Thank you for sharing that. That's that's perfect, and and that is the essence because the. Within the church, there are actually two groups of people. There are the religious, who have a form of righteousness, but deny the power because they don't have the Holy Spirit. And that's the power of the kingdom, folks. 
Only the Spirit brings life, eternal life. And only through the Spirit can we do things of eternal value, because the flesh profits nothing. But So there are people who are not born of the Spirit of God, therefore they're walking in a Christian religion that is predicated upon the flesh. And they are, I'm sorry to say, the Scripture describes them as the congregations of the dead. Jesus said on that day, many of them will say to me, Lord, Lord, these are people that are actually not born again, and therefore they are not filled with the Holy Spirit. They're only filled with religious doctrine, knowledge of good and evil, and a lot of them are filled with religious spirits from hell as well, like the Pharisees. But then the true church is walking in the truth which is the Spirit of Jesus Christ. Paul mentioned this in Galatians 4, where he said, tell me, this is verse 21, tell me, you that desire to be under the law, because this whole contention of, you know, now that we've got the revelation, are we going to go forward in the strength of the flesh, or are we going to wait for the promise of God and learn how to move and operate in the Holy Spirit? And there were two camps, because the camp that did not have the Holy Spirit, they don't even understand what we're talking about. They have no clue what it means to wait on the Lord. They have no clue what it means to receive the real word of God and for revelation to come forth out of heaven. The only revelation they have is coming out of their dark counsel. But they're convinced it's the truth. And so the children of the flesh, who really have no living manna, they hate the children of the Spirit. And they've been at war, these two kingdoms, have been at war because the children of the flesh who are not yet born again are still walking in the darkness. Paul addressed this in Galatians 4.21. You that desire to be under the law, do you hear the law? It was written, Abraham had two sons, the one a slave, the other from a free woman. But who was of the slave was born after the flesh? He's, Paul's telling us Esau, pardon me, Ishmael, was born in the flesh. But the son of the free woman was from or of the promise. Isaac is the son of the spirit and of the promise of God. Ishmael was done by the flesh. Abraham and Sarah got together and they were going to make God's promise happen. They weren't going to wait for the Lord to do what he said he would do because they'd already waited, I think, 25 years or 20 years. It was a long wait and so, you know, Sarah had the bright idea, maybe we should help God. Maybe we should do something in the flesh to fulfill the promise God made in the Spirit. And, and the great idea they came up with was Abraham to have a son he named Ishmael, who today is the father of the Islamic and Muslim nations. And that hasn't worked out real well. And we've all done our Ishmael. And Ishmael is a son of bondage, because he's in bondage to the flesh, because he was born of the flesh. And each seed is after its own kind. The flesh can only produce the seed of more flesh. Only the Spirit can bring forth the works of the Spirit. That's why we had to learn to wait for the seed of the Spirit to begin bringing new life in us, before we could ever do the true works of the kingdom. And Paul goes on and he says that this was an allegory. These two sons, Ishmael and Isaac, are a picture for us of the two covenants. The one from Mount Sinai. That was the Torah, my friends. And Paul is saying Ishmael is a picture of the Torah. Well, that's amazing. And that Isaac is a picture of the new covenant. Ishmael is the son of Sinai, who, which gendereth, which brings to, or leads us into bondage, which is Agar. For this Agar is Mount Sinai in Arabia, and answers to Jerusalem, which is now and is in bondage with her children. What he's saying is that the whole religious system is in bondage to this mind of the flesh. But the, even the Jerusalem that is on the earth in Paul's day, 
very much like Jerusalem in our day, is still in the deception of the mind of the flesh and is under the curse of the knowledge of good and evil. And what if you go to Jerusalem, I've lived in Jerusalem, and you walk around and meet and greet the people, you'll find everybody striving over how to keep the law. But none of them are walking in the promise of the Holy Spirit. It's the, the bondage of the flesh. And yet, if that's all you've received, that's all you know, and it's all you can give birth to in your life as well. But Paul goes on in Galatians 4.26, But Jerusalem, which is from above, is free. And when we're in the anointing, when we're in the Holy Spirit, when we've entered into the presence of the Holy Spirit, and we are now beginning to study the Word, preach the Word, with the power of the Holy Spirit in us, now we're being led by the Lord. Now God leads us into freedom. Whosoever the Son sets free is free indeed. But if you're not yet free indeed, if the Son hasn't set you free, then you are in slavery. And that slavery is to the principle of the flesh. Galatians 4.27 For it is written, Rejoice, O barren one! Break forth and cry, thou which travailest not. For the desolate has many more children than she who has a husband. And here he's talking about the children of the Spirit who, while waiting on the Lord, appear to have nothing. They are waiting, and they appear to be barren. They've not yet bore fruit, because the fruit that they've been chosen to bear will be the fruit of the Spirit, and it comes forth in the appointed time by the direction and the commandment of the Lord after the latter rains have fallen, and we have to wait for the Lord. We can't just do it in the flesh. And so for a season, the religious appear to be, you know, they've got the great programs, and, you know, I, I remember one person saying to me, well, how many people attend your church? We've got 5,000! Great, right? As if the kingdom was a numerical question, you know? Woe unto you when, when all men speak well unto you. Many shall seek to enter by the wide road. The five thousands are on the wide road. The mega churches are, for the most part, filled with people seeking to enter through the wide road, and it's the way of the flesh. And oh, by the way, it's any way you want it to be. I mean, and what a great deal, right? You can have it your way. You get to keep whatever things of the flesh you want to keep, and you can believe in Jesus, too. And Satan really does well selling this apostate false faith. And it's predicated on the deception of the flesh. And it's sold to people who, having never received the Spirit of God, have no ability to discern the true from the false. And so the broad way seems to them like the correct way. But those who've been born again, they know when the Master said, Strive, agonize, seek to enter through the narrow way, for straight is the gate, and narrow is the way that leads to eternal life, and few there be that find it. And the first step in the path of eternal life is you must be born again by the Holy Spirit. And if any man has not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. And so, you know, the, all of this, religious confusion that has come into a church that is in bondage because the power, the breakthrough power, the Spirit of God is not moving freely in the congregations today. And so the people are like, well, well how are we going to fix this? Like Sarah and Abraham, and we've come up with our great idea, let's create an Ishmael. Let's do something akin or similar to to the birth of Ishmael. Let's give birth to some doctrine, some religious identity of the flesh. Oh, it's, it's all of, you know, we need to dress up like we're Jewish, and, and we need to dress like we lived 3,000 years ago. If we all put yarmulkes on our head, and we got prayer shawls, you know, that would do it. No. That is just more deception from Sinai. 
is all the deception of the flesh. No, it's our pride and our rebellion and our secret sins that we've hidden even from ourselves. And it's the deep matters of the heart that are in rebellion to the righteousness of God that are the issue. And we don't need to learn to, how to keep the Sabbath better. We don't need to worry about following all the commandments of men. The promise of God is to those who receive it through the Spirit. That is what has been God's plan from the beginning, and He's not going to change it now at the end. Only those who can enter in. You know, Romans 8, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus and who are led of the Holy Spirit, not walking around in the mind of the flesh. You know, those who dwell in the secret hiding place of the Most High God, that is a place that exists in the Spirit. You are not going to enter the secret hiding place of God through the strength of the flesh. I don't care how well you keep the Sabbath on Saturday or whatever day you think is your Sabbath. Personally, I think we're in the seventh day of creation. So from my viewpoint, they're all Sabbath days now. And we need to be doing the will of God each and every day of the week. But the promise of Romans 8, that there is no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, that doesn't mean that you have a ministry of the flesh and you believe in Christ Jesus. It means you dwell in the Lord, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. The promise is to those who walk in the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit, oh, what, what law might this be? It's a different law than the law given in the flesh. That's what Paul is alluding to in Galatians 4 when he says that the law which was given in Sinai, which is the original covenant given to Moses, given in the flesh to Israel in the flesh, is an allegory of Ishmael. It was done in the flesh. That's why God repealed it. And if you read, if you study the scriptures carefully, you'll find out the old covenant has been canceled. And it's been replaced by a new covenant, which you can only partake in if you receive the promise of the Spirit and are thereby born again. The Spirit goes wheresoever He wills. And He brings life to whoever calls on the Lord with a pure heart. For the law of the Spirit of life in Jesus Christ has made me free from the law of sin and death. And that's the law of the flesh. Flesh profits nothing. Our flesh will die. Your flesh is going to die. My flesh is going to die. Even if we survive until the sign of the Son of Man appears in the heavens and we are raptured or translated off this planet to meet the Lord in the clouds, you're not going with your flesh. Your flesh is under the law of sin and death. So we're not going to enter the kingdom. We're not going to receive the promises through the law of sin and death. We're going to receive the promise of God through the law of the Spirit. Romans 8, verse 3. For what the law of the flesh could not do. Can't be done, people. Especially now that God has canceled it, it is for sure impossible. You know, so if you try to dress up like a bunch of Israelites and you want to go down into the Negev desert and walk around and seek the Lord according to the Torah, you're not going to get anywhere with God. The Lord has moved on. He's actually canceled that covenant. And I know a lot of people, you know, uh, they rage against me. I have to preach these truths. And the people who are devoid of the wisdom of the Spirit of God and who are full of the pride of life and full of the law of sin and death, and it's their religion that I'm challenging, you know, I'm tearing down their high place and I'm leveling that mountain of deception, they don't like it. And so they gnash their teeth at me. But, brothers and sisters, I present the Holy Scripture as my defense. 
This is the revelation of Jesus Christ for what the law of the flesh could never do, in that it was weak because of the flesh God himself did by sending his own son. And God is also going to do by sending the Holy Spirit. It is God who brings about the born-again new life in us. We can't make ourselves born again any more than you made yourself born the first time. What did you have to do with getting born? Did anybody say to you, would you like to become a baby? No. You had nothing to do with it. So it is the new birth. It, although we can cry out and ask God for this life, and thanks be to God that his mercy endures forever. For the Lord says, whoever calls upon the name of the Lord in this hour shall be saved. So if you desire earnestly the things of the kingdom of God, you can call upon the name of the Lord. If, you, if you're not sure that you've been born again, this promise is available to you and to whosoever would believe in the promise of God and call upon his name in truth. But we're in a spiritual war, and so... You know, if you don't inish, initially enter in, you guys, you've got to stand and wait, which is what Jesus said from the beginning. Wait until the power comes. Wait until you receive the promise. Wait on God. It's His Word. He said it. He will deliver it. The only question is, are we willing to wait on the Lord and to learn to enter into the things of the Spirit? Romans 8, verse 5, For they that are after the flesh, they who walk according to the religious deceptions of the flesh. Mind the things of the flesh. They're focused on the flesh. They're looking for the pleasure of the flesh. And I'll tell you, the main motivators, money is a big one. Right after that is, what are we going to eat? They never fast and pray because it's about filling their belly and the things of the flesh. That's the entire identity, is the food and the pleasure, and the women, and the gold, and whatever junk they can, they can put in their mouth. Mm. And then how much wealth can they take? Those well, are the Benjamin, things of the are, flesh. We are unfortunately getting down to the end of the program. I, I should have warned you a little earlier, but I got so wrapped up in what you were talking about, brother, I couldn't hardly, uh, I just was listening, and want to thank well, you for that. Let me finish this one scripture. Eight, yeah. Romans 8, 5. But they that are walking after the Spirit of God are mindful of the things of the Spirit, and these are the things of the Lord. So they're not seeking their own agenda. They're seeking the will of God, which has come down and has been revealed through the life of Jesus Christ. Amen. Okay, Frank, Amen. go ahead and wrap no, up. No, no, I want to say thank you so much. And folks, listen, what Benjamin's saying, you've you got to understand. I know we have Sabbath and Sunday keepers listening to this program, okay? What the truth is here is that if you do not have a walk with God, filled with the Spirit of God, you can obey yourself clear into hell. And that's a fact. Because there will be Sabbath and Sunday keepers both in hell one day. The truth is, is you've got to be born again. Yes, the, obedience is a very important thing, folks, but if you look in the book of Jude, Jude said in the very beginning, he said, I wish, he wanted them to contend for the faith that was once delivered to the saints. And the reason he wanted the people to do that in the book of Jude is because there were men coming in with false doctrines, and the only way to protect yourself against these lies and deceptions was to contend for the faith that was once delivered to the saints. What he's saying is you've got to focus and put everything everything into your walk and your, and your desire in Jesus Christ, or you will be deceived. And that's a fact, and you can take it to the bank. Folks, Benjamin, I, I, I just extend the program just a few minutes here and try to wrap it up, but I, I wanted to say something. Benjamin, I, I remember when you talked about seeing the tribulation of the last days, and years ago you, you talked about you were so shook up by it that you we're so afraid to even go and get your kids some milk because what was you, the Lord had shown you was coming was so intense that you, you prayed just to go out and get your kids some milk. I, folks, I want you to understand that what's coming upon this earth, your flesh will not be able to deliver you in. Your flesh will not save you in it. And if you're not filled with the Spirit of God and born again, you have no chance 
in surviving these last days? You know, I'm not trying to bring an offense to people that are Sabbath keepers and that want to honor the Lord by keeping the Sabbath holy unto God and set that day aside to seek the Lord and for relationship with family and fellowship with the community of the faithful. I am not opposed to people keeping the Sabbath. What I am trying to point out is the Pharisees kept the Sabbath and that Jesus called them sons of the serpent. Mm. If all we have is the religious observance of the commandments of God, and we don't have the Holy Spirit, if we have not waited on the Lord for the promise of the anointing from on high, then what we're doing is all being done through the flesh. And yes. even if it's right, it's profiting us nothing. Amen. There will be no reward in the kingdom of heaven for having kept the commandments of God through the power of the flesh. Mm. We will be penniless on that day. Only Amen. the things done by the Holy Spirit can profit us in terms of eternity and in terms of the, the truth of the kingdom of God. And, you know, that is not the focus of many, many people. People want to argue about, you know, how do we do these things in the flesh? And the answer is, you don't. Learn to wait on the Lord and learn Amen. to walk in the Spirit. Spirit. And then if you have a question of, you know, what is it that God's asked or wants me to do with this or with that, then simply ask the Lord. And if you're walking in the Holy Spirit, the Lord will lead you into all truth. You need no man to teach you. The Holy Spirit will come as your counselor and your comforter. i got to tell you, Frank, all of the congregations that I've been aware of, and I've traveled extensively, there is a great falling away in the land. Well, There's been a great yes. falling away, and, you know, everybody wants to think that it's some other church, but in all honesty, I, I think it's in all of us to varying degrees. And, you know, girding up the loins of our flesh, you know, we're just going to try to do the law just a little bit better, isn't going to cut it. Not only that, it's not going to do us any good. You wasted the day, you wasted the time, and you wasted the opportunity to finally understand that we must learn to enter into the things of the Spirit. Because as we focus on the commandments of the Lord, which are, you know, the shadows, if you will, the Old Covenant commandments were a shadow of the revelation of God's righteousness given to instruct people walking in the darkness. We're supposed to be entering into the presence of God filled with the Holy Spirit so we could begin to see the light of the revelation. That's why Jesus told us, the law says you shall not murder. I tell you, you should not hate. So hmm. the commandment says don't murder, but the righteousness of God says do not hate. The law says do not commit adultery. Jesus said, I tell you, the righteousness of God says do not even lust in your heart. And so the, the ways of the Lord are actually above the commandments that were given to Israel in the flesh. Amen. We need to become perfect, and you know that's probably going to be the next message if, if you have me back, you know, if any of the listeners will come back, if I haven't made everybody an enemy. But you know, Jesus had the same problem, and so did Paul. They hated Paul. That the Jews wanted to kill Paul. He was telling them that a greater revelation had come, and that it wasn't about keeping the law through the knowledge of good and evil anymore. And the Pharisees, who were devoid of the Spirit, all they had was the law and the knowledge of good and evil, Paul basically told them, you guys are bankrupt. Well, mm. what do you think their response was? They wanted to kill him. Yeah. They did the same thing to Jesus. They wanted to kill him too, and eventually they did arrange for him to be martyred on that Passover day when he died for our sins. And so, um, you know, no, if people are angry at me, um, nope. and I do detect, I do discern, there is some angst out there with this message. You know, test all things, and, uh, you know, God bless you guys. And hey, Benjamin, you know, you always have a place on my show. And folks, I want you to take this to heart. It's sometimes hard to understand you know 
obedience in and of itself will never save a single person. It just won't do it. You've got to have a walk with God. And, and I remember one time a guy told me this, Benjamin. He said, I don't drink, not drink because the church says don't drink. He says, I drink all that I want. I just don't want to drink those things anymore. And I rem- that spoke to me volumes that day, Benjamin, because what it told me was he had had a transformed mind, not just an act of trying to not drink, but that his mind was transformed by the Spirit of the living God. Amen. And that's a different thing than just trying to keep something in your flesh versus when God gets in and changes the physical. What Benjamin just said, God has raised the bar as a believer. Actually, it's more than the Old Covenant. It's about your mind being in tune with God. And, and folks, exactly. if, if, you, if you haven't heard Benjamin's old messages on, on um, the knowledge of good and evil and, and dark counsel, go out on YouTube and look for them because they are powerful and it will tell you exactly what the problems are and what people are living in this dark counsel in this day and age in the churches. And Benjamin, you're right. We so often think it's somebody else when many times it is us with the problem. Amen. And, you know, people also, if they don't want to, um, or they can't find it on the Internet, the Dark Council message, the uh, Ministry of Death message, and the message of First Fruit, which is the, the remnant believers, they're all part of the book, Search the Scriptures Out of the Darkness, which is volume one of the Search the Scriptures series, and um, that's a real powerful word, megaton of truth in that, in that book, so if people haven't heard, and um, the very first section or chapter of Out of the Darkness is a message entitled, Matters of the Heart, mm-hmm. and if uh, our listeners want to get the book, Out of the Darkness, I think you'd find it to be one of the most powerful books, it is certainly anointed. I've read it five or six times. Every time I read it, it blows me away. And when I listen to those messages, they were not um, something I did. I mean, that message matters of the heart, Frank. All I had was that word. The Lord had spoken Mm -hmm. to me. I want to speak on the matters of the heart. That was it. And a three-hour message came out that's probably one of the most powerful. And then dark counsel is the flip side of the coin which is the religious mind of the flesh and how it is not walking in righteousness. But it's so convinced of itself. It's so full of pride. And it's so bound up that it'll crucify you if you even suggest perhaps it should repent. But the reality is that knowledge, that carnal mind that is in us, it cannot repent. It's at enmity with God. It must be put to death. We must put off the old man and the old mind of the flesh. We have to put on the mind of Christ, which is not... the. You can't receive the mind of Christ through the knowledge of good and evil. You receive the curse through the knowledge of good and evil. And so that mind that has fallen into the dark counsel of this ruined age that could be so religious and yet so unrighteous at the same time, that has to be put to death. We have to die to that and overcome mm. it in order to put on the mind of Christ and to enter into the things of God. And, you know, those two camps, the camp that's in the Ishmael category, the camp that's in the power and the mind of the flesh, and the camp that's being led by the Spirit of God, they're enemies one of another. And, you know, the people of the camp of Ishmael, they don't really like Isaac any more than the Muslims like the Israelis. Yeah. It's mm. true. I mean, these, you know, that, that particular camp hates us. Now, the Israelis don't really hate the Muslims, but the Muslims hate the Israelis. And I'm not just speaking from one who has no experience. I lived in East Jerusalem. I went to graduate school there, and I actually lived there. I've been to Israel uh, probably like 20 times. And I can tell you for sure, because I hung out with the uh, Arabs and Palestinians and and I knew those people personally, they hate the Jews. I mean, they, two 17-year-old girls uh, um, were sitting out at the Dan Jerusalem Hotel on Mount Scopus. 
I walk up, and they're like, you know, you're an American. We, will, we want to talk English with you. I'm like, okay, sure. First thing they say to me is, do you hate the Jews? I'm like, no. No, I don't hate anybody. We hate them. We want to kill them. These are 17-year-old girls, cute little Arab girls. I'm like, what are you doing hating anybody? You should want to get married and have a family and you know, have little cute babies. What, what do you want to kill people for? But they do. They hate them. And so the children of the flesh, they can't do anything but oppose the children of the spirit because the flesh is under the curse. And, you know, as much as... And the one thing about flesh, and I'll just wrap with this comment, it's, it's filled with the pride of life. The flesh is naturally proud. I mean, we know we're right. You go ask anybody who's walking around in the dark council of this ruined world and who's under the delusions of this fallen age and who's walking in the knowledge of good and evil, and they're judging using the knowledge they inherited from the fall between what's good and what's evil. And you ask them, you know, how, how correct are you in everything that you think? And, you know, if they're honest, they'll tell you, well, everything I think is right. They're right about everything. You got six billion people, seven billion people that know everything, and they're right about everything, except for the vast majority of them are going to go to hell. So how right mm. was that? Mm. And the answer is they weren't right about anything. They're being deceived in all of it, and there's nothing more deceiving than than somebody who names the name of Jesus is firmly committed to the wide road ministry of their own choosing and is gospel-hardened to any truth out of Scripture, because they already know they're saved. And they're going to do, you know, whatever's right in their eyes, and, and, you know, and they will kill you if you so much as get in their way. And they're full of pride, and yet they'll deny it. Oh, I'm not proud. You know? <laughs> you know, the number one thing we do with our sin is deny it. Mm. Deny, deny, deny. It's not my sin. I mean, Adam started this right after the fall when the Lord came and said, Adam, and what was his, what was his answer? God, the, the woman you gave me, Adam blamed God for giving him Eve. That's the reason he ate the fruit. God, it's your fault. You gave me that woman. She tricked me. Adam didn't own any of it. Neither did Eve. The serpent beguiled me. And so it is to this day. The children of the flesh deny all of their sin and or project it onto another. Mm. And in many of them who have named the name of Jesus but have never received the born-again life of the Spirit of God, they're gospel-hardened. These people are going to hell, and I'm not making that up. Jesus warned us many would seek to enter through the wide road of the mind of the flesh and would not be allowed. And the word for many is polis in the Greek, and it means the vast majority. And the same thing happened to ancient Israel. And we were told in the prophecies of Isaiah, though the number of the children of Israel be as the sand of the sea, only a remnant is being saved. Judgment is overflowing with righteousness. So too, unto the Jew first, it happened in Israel. Now it's happening in the Gentile New Covenant churches. Though the number of people who profess to be a Christian is as the sand of the sea, only a remnant is born again. And the rest of them are on the wide road, seeking to enter in through the knowledge of good and evil. I believe in Jesus. I read the Bible. Oh, you did, did you? That's nice. Now, what Bible did you read? Did you read the Bible through the natural mind? Or did you read the Rima Bible through the Holy Spirit? Mm. If all you're doing is, uh, is walking this out through the flesh, they that are after the flesh mind the things of the flesh, and the carnal mind is at enmity at God. It is not subject to the law of God, neither can it be. Now, it can keep a version of the Sabbath. 
The carnal mind can keep a carnal version of the commandments of God, but it cannot keep the law of the Spirit of God, and therefore mm. it is rejected. They that are in the flesh cannot please God. But you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if it be that the Spirit of God dwells in you. Now, if any man has not the Spirit of Jesus Christ, he is none of his. So if you're a Christian who doesn't have the anointing, you don't have the Holy Spirit in you, then you are actually not a purchased possession of Jesus Christ. Mm. You are actually of the many who are on the wide road. And I'm, you know, I would pray for you. I would try to help you. Uh, we, you know, those of us who really know the Lord, we will do everything we can to help you. The problem is you hate us. As we try to save you, you throw rocks at us because we're threatening your high places. Mm. We're about to uncover the fraud of your false confession. And the old pride nature, the first thing it wants to do is defend its ego. And so it denies, it denies the antidote. It refuses the one thing that could save it, which is humility and repentance. And instead they go on. I mean, look at the Pharisees. You know, they accused Jesus of having a demon. Wrong. Jesus was full of the Holy Spirit. He's God Almighty. They had the demons. And yet they went to the grave proud of the fact, we're not bastards. You know, they, they were accusing Jesus of being conceived before wedlock. If you read the text, at one point, you know, they say, we know who our father is. Because they knew, they had searched out, you know, they'd sent their little private investigators to Nazareth, and they'd searched out the story on this Jesus of Nazareth, and they found out it was common knowledge that Joseph and Mary got. They were betrothed, and Jesus was born a few months later, folks. Do the math, right? So they were accusing him of being a bastard, not realizing he was born of the Holy Spirit. God was his Father, and in the birth of Jesus Christ was the most holy, righteous event in all of creation. And they stood and condemned the Lord. And they said, nothing good comes from Nazareth. In their knowledge of good and evil, they knew he was from Nazareth. They never bothered to ask him, how old are you? Was there a census in the year you were born? What, what, what city is your family actually from? Oh, Bethlehem? Wait a minute. But see, in their knowledge of good and evil, they knew he was from Nazareth. They didn't need anybody to tell him different. Yet he was born in Bethlehem. That's the problem with the knowledge of good and evil. It yeah. is just a catastrophe. And it's never been anything but a disaster. And that's why, you know, the Bible says, you know, lean not on your own understanding. Don't put any confidence in that knowledge of good and evil. It's going to get you in trouble every time. Judge righteously through the witness and the, and the revelation of the Holy Spirit. Now, the people that don't have the Spirit of God, they can't understand how people with the Spirit can judge by the Spirit. That's another reason those two camps fight each other. Because the people who only have the knowledge of good and evil always resist the revelation that comes by the Spirit. Because they can't, they can't understand it. They've already got their way with their knowledge of good and evil. And they're convinced they're right. They're always right. And so there you have the essence between the two camps. One well, of light, I, one of darkness. I thank Benjamin. I, I just want to say, folks, listen, if you've had your toe stepped on, maybe that's a good thing. Because if it drives you to seek God in a deeper way, then I just want to say thank you, Jesus. Because the fact is, folks, is that in our flesh we cannot please God. We will never please God. And, and all I can tell you is this about Benjamin. This is the one thing I know. In 1999, I woke up a drug addict, addicted to crystal meth, running around on my wife, doing everything wrong. I could not quit. I tried over and over again, and I ended up worse. And somebody had the courage to hand me 
the day of the Lord is at hand by, by Benjamin Baruch. Mm-hmm. And when I read that book, God got a hold of me in such a powerful way and got into my heart finally and revealed himself to me. And through that revelation of Jesus Christ, I was delivered, not of my flesh, not of what I could do. I'd already tried on my own and I failed. But when I surrendered to him, when I plead and I cried out to God, that is when he saved my life and delivered me from that. And that's why I know it was a miracle, because in my flesh I could not do it. And folks, that is the point of this program tonight, is that in your flesh you will die. But in the Spirit you will have life. And life everlasting because you are following God. And when your mind is transformed, you don't need anybody to say, Thou shalt not uh, kill, because it won't be in you anymore to kill. It won't be a part of you. See, obedience is not a fight when you are walking with the Lord. It's not a struggle when you are walking in the Spirit. Because when you walk in the Spirit and you have the mind of Jesus, you want to do what He does. And so, Benjamin, thank you for challenging us tonight and reminding us that in all of our fleshly good, in as good as they may be, nothing can save us but a walk with Jesus Christ. And I want to say thank you for that, Benjamin. And um, by Amen. God's grace, we would love to have you come back on again. Well, maybe we might finish this if we do a part three. Brother, this is so good. I, I, the only reason I'm ending this, Benjamin, is because I, we've got to. But other oh, than that, um, we've got to, maybe we need to do a part three on this because this is just getting it's just getting too good. You know, I can understand how a lot of people resist and can't quite grasp this revelation. This is not easy to see. And that's why Paul wrestled with so many people as he tried to tell them, look, it's by the Spirit. Don't go back to the flesh. You know, and yes, the tutor is still there if we don't get it. The law will tell us the ways that we need to walk. You know, the law has not been canceled, but the new covenant is a higher revelation. And it's only people born again under the new covenant that are actually being saved. The Mm. old covenant never saved anybody. It never saved anyone because it never can save anyone. That's why it was replaced with the covenant of faith. And so, but Frank, thank you for uh, hosting the program tonight. I pray that this word was of uh, a blessing to some of the listeners. And um, you know. Uh, test all things. If things aren't confirmed for you, then, you know, let them go. God bless you all, and uh, we'll talk to you soon. No, thank you for that, Benjamin, for coming on. And, folks, please, do your homework. Go into the, go to the Lord in prayer. Seek God, and, and let Him reveal to you what His will is in your life. At the end of the day, Benjamin and I, we're simply people. We're not God, but we want you to seek God with all your heart. And at the end of the day, do what the Lord tells you to do, not what man says to do. And, I, and Benjamin, one thing you've always said through the years, you need to ask God about these things. And that is the truth. That is the truth. So with all that, I just want to say thank you, Brother Benjamin, for coming on. Thank you, everybody, for listening in. This is the Remnant Call, and this is Brother Frank saying good night and shalom. Oh, God.